on them, Gordon McComb and people like that. Ah, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've not really written books, but I, I can write documentation, I think. That was oh, very see. hard when I started, you know, it's really hard when you don't, haven't done something before, it was so slow, but now I can, I can make documentation pretty methodically. Well, ever since I started, the very first time I ever picked up a microcontroller, it seems like I've seen your name everywhere. <laughs> so to me, you're a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not here at this house. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody is to their own family. <laughs> All right. We're going to start now. I'm just going to mute you all, but uh, don't let that discourage you from uh, unmuting yourself. It's just temporary. So I'll take care of that really quick. And the mute all button does not seem to work. I can mute. <laughs> yeah, for the first time, the button fails. So um, anyway, it's not a problem with the number of people we have here. So uh, if you could just Un unmute yourself when you want to talk. Otherwise, keep yourself muted. It'll really help when the dogs show up. Okay, there I go. I got you all muted. Anyway, welcome to the Propeller 2 live forum. I'm Ken Gracie, and today we have um, a load of unique topics we want to get through. Um, MicroPython with TMOZ and graphical debug with chip with a whole bunch of things sprinkled in between. All fun stuff. So our agenda looks like this. Um, first off, I wanna welcome everybody here who's a first time visitor to the Propeller2 live forum. Um, we have a huge number of signups today and um, many will be dropped in here and wonder what we're talking about. And there are people in the room that have 10, 15 years um, advance on your learning already, but don't let that intimidate you. I'm blinking an LED um, just to break the ice and all these people can help us out. So I welcome you if you're new here. So first, uh, Chip will talk briefly about the Propeller 2 for those who've jumped in as a first time. And um, in between Chip and the handoff to Johnny Mac to share his progress on object development and a real-time clock, I will talk about next week's presentation just for a minute, um, which will be basic with Eric Smith. And then we get into the meat, which is MicroPython. Super exciting. These guys have been working on it for well over a year and um, see what they have to say. And then we have a special offer. Have you heard about the special offer? Um, if you receive my many emails, thank you and I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> this is how we communicate with all of you. And then we'll move on to Chip's graphical debug tools. Hopefully the agenda sounds good. So for those first time um, arrivals here, uh, and I don't, I don't know what you know about our history, but I threw this together really quick just to give you an idea, um, a little timeline of where we are today and what Chip is talking about. So Parallax and Chip's history go way back here to really the late 80s, but it was in the early 90s that uh, Chip started working a lot with uh, microcontrollers and making development tools for the PIC. And we made the first PIC programmer, third-party PIC programmer at Parallax which Microchip eventually bought. And we also made emulators. Um, but around 92 and 95, uh, Chip created the basic stamp one and two, which were uh, huge and to this day are still used. Um, very popular products 25 years later. And his microcontroller development experience um, really started off, I think, in the late 90s when he worked with Scenic Semiconductor, who became Ubicom. And then eventually that chip you're looking at from 1997 has a parallax mark on it. It's the SX50 MIPS 8-bit processor that many of you worked with actually. Um, I know Johnny Mac did a lot of basic stuff with it and chip produced a ton of code. Unfortunately, that chip um, passed away due to things beyond our control involving lawyers. Um, but then Chip took off on his own and then created the Propeller 1, which was um, a full custom manual layout, and that came out in 2006. And then shortly after that, he moved on to the P2. And that process um, brings us to where we are today with a lot of little things in between those 13 years that are too numerous to discuss. But um, basically, there have been you know robots, applications, boards, um, several versions of 
the hardware we have today, including one called P2 Hot, which was warm enough to cook eggs on it. And now we have the Propeller 2 ready to be released and we're anxiously awaiting the first production delivery, um, which is supposed to arrive on November 6th at Parallax. So I like to point, out, point this out because um, Chip has really learned a lot through this process and developed a lot of skill and really sticks with something. And that is very inspiring for many of us where like my job is more of a daily effort, but he thinks in terms of years. So yeah, so anyway, the early adopter process is what you're a part of right now. And we're planning on releasing the Propeller 2 with the new website and with a whole bunch of hardware in November. And this morning, the release day was November 9th, but we're having trouble integrating the website with our business software. So now we're, we're pushing it a little bit down the road and I'm just trying to get it done by Thanksgiving. So also if you're new, um, all of these P2 Live forums are recorded, they're posted up on YouTube, so you could check them out. There's discussion about tools, video, signals, audio, um, different languages. Some of these videos are very long, but you can take a look at them um, under the Parallax Inc. YouTube channel, Propeller 2 Early Adopter Series. And then another great place where many people here today also live is on the P2 forums forums.parallax.com, so you can go here. And um, one salesy item before I go on to chip, uh, these displays are currently 20% off, but you know I have a knack for salesmanship, so I'll be uh, presenting you with another special offer in one short hour from now, if you can hold on. So chip, um, what is the P2 for the new arrivals? Uh, so the P2, um is something we worked on for quite a while. It's kind of a follow on to the P1, but the whole concept behind the propellers is that you have multiple processors. And I know this is redundant for a lot of you, but Ken noticed there were so many new people signed up, or they must be new because we don't have these high numbers normally, but we should probably go over a little bit of background about the chip. So the, the idea in the propeller chips is that uh, you have multiple processors and they're actually separate hardware on the die uh, that make up separate processors that all run concurrently and they share a global memory and IO pins. And uh, what you do with multiple processors is not what the common assumption would be in that you take a task and divide it out and then share the workload among processors. That's something that you can do. Um, but really the good thing about having multiple processors is that you can give them each completely separate jobs and then have them communicate with each other through symbolic variables um, as if, you know, you have many separate computers running that just magically share variables. So if you're designing a system that has some, say, motion control and a user interface and some kind of comm, you can put all those, uh, you, can, you can divide up all those tasks on separate processors and write very manageable, simple programs to do stuff that you could never harangue a regular controller into doing because you would have too many uh, timing problems. There'd be all kinds of jitter. And, but this way you get eight, eight deterministic uh, timings across eight separate processors. And on the P2, which is, um, you know, the next thing after the P1, there are uh, smart pin circuits, which are on every single pin. So every pin um, has, aside from its IO capability of, of being able to, uh, it has an ADC, so it can take analog in. It has uh, three kinds of DACs. Two of them are external. One is internal for comparison. Um, it has a lot of feedback modes. So there's a lot of analog capability in each pin. And they can all run concurrently, just like the COGS. But the smart pin circuits can perform uh, kind of mm, like operations over time on the pins so that you can realize things like serial ports and PWM and um, A to D conversion with different types of uh, filters. And uh, all this stuff happens without any kind of handholding from the processor. You can just kind of set and forget. And uh, if you wanna know what the ADC value is, you can just read the, uh, read the value whenever you want. Uh, so this idea is that it's, easy to, it's easier to approach complex problems by being able to divide things up logically, not 
a court, not trying to map it to a single architecture, but take advantage of many concurrent things that can run. So this keeps your, keeps your uh, sanity if you're trying to do a lot of things at once. And this is the board that we, I mainly use here. Uh, it's our eval board. Um, some people on the forum like uh, Peter Jakaki and Clouseau have made uh, other boards and we also have a new module, but um, I use this thing just because it's mainly what we make. It has all these 8-bit connectors on it and uh, it talks uh, over USB. Um, now, one little thing about the chip I didn't mention, it has, uh, this is the chip here in the middle. It has 512K bytes of RAM, and these are divided into eight separate physical instances on the die. And every clock, another processor, each processor gets another slice of that memory. So this enables, in the end, every single processor or cog, we call them, to read or write 32 bits on every single clock. And this chip is designed to run at 175 megahertz at, uh, at a very high temperature, one that was unrealistically high because we were anticipating a lot of power dissipation that didn't wind up in the design because we put clock gating in and other things that really cut the dynamic power down. But anyway, uh, we can run these things. I can run this on my desk at 320 megahertz all day. And uh, that means that you can do basically input and output every three nanoseconds. Although there is a time to get a signal out and then a time to get it back in. Um, but I, we're trying to right now figure out what our, we're waiting for on semi who did the foundry work to give us some results from some timing analysis so that we can derate that 150 C junction temperature and come up with some real realistic operating frequencies that, you know, over, a broader temperature range or you know from like say 30c to uh, up to 150. Anyway that's kind of a summary of the chip. Any quick questions for Chip? Uh, we're going to hear from him in more detail in a bit but uh, if you have any uh, short questions you want to ask now you're welcome to. Okay. Chip, on the HD converters, what do you estimate the maximum conversion rate would be in uh, conversions per second? Well, okay, so it's, it's, these are uh, one bit ADCs at the heart. They're sigma or delta sigma converters. So we have sync to filtration in the smart pins. That means that you can get like an eight bit uh, sample in 128 clocks. So okay. If you're running at, let's say 256 megahertz, you could have a nine bit sample every microsecond from each pin. And they go up to in quality about, I can get pretty stable 13 to 14 bit conversions. Thank you. Those, those, of, those of course would take longer, like that would take a 14 bit conversion would take 8,000 clocks. Uh, so it's, let's see, what would, What's 320 megahertz divided by 8192? Can anyone do the math? That would be the conversion rate at that frequency. And then the DAX, on the other hand, are just super fast. They settle in about two and a half nanoseconds and uh, they're very low impedance and they have to be low impedance in order to push high frequency. So the DAX can go down to 75 ohms at two volts. And they're 8-bit, and we have in the smart pin some oversampling circuitry so that in 256 clocks, you can get like a 16-bit conversion. Although, you know, I don't know what the integral nonlinearity is over that range, but I would think that the, the DAC is probably good, even though it's 8-bits, it probably has about 11-bit linearity. So the, the math is 39K hertz. 39 kilohertz. 32, 320 megahertz. Of Thanks, Ray. Okay. Good question, Jim. Thanks, Chip. Um, also, if you're just coming into this, you can go to propeller.parallax.com. This is our current holding bay for um, Parallax and community contributed resources. And this will be wrapped into a new website that I mentioned mid-November or so. But there are links to everything there. Um, so after we hear from T Moz and before we hear from Chip, we'll talk about the special offer All right in front of you. I can see everyone smiling, cool stuff. Um, and uh, 
So now on to Johnny Mac. Um, before Johnny Mac gets started, we are supporting 22 plus of these click boards on all the boards we make. And John is producing uh, most of the objects to get us going. And then Roy has agreed to pick up some of the C libraries for them. And Roy, I'll ship that hardware when John is pretty much done with it because it kind of gets adds up in expense. And John, what do you have today? <clears throat> hey, as Ken said, he's asked me to start some uh, code libraries for the various click modules that uh, we're starting with. Um, I guess I should. How do I share my screen, Ken? Green button at the bottom oh, of sorry, you. share screen. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, are you able to see? Hopefully everybody's seeing a picture of a P2 eval with a click module on it. Yep, we do. Okay, yeah, so this is a P2 eval. This is uh, the, the Rev C. And this is a click module from, from Microelectronica that uses uh, their uh, bus, uh, the microbus interface, which is, is really, as I was explaining to a friend of mine this morning, it's not really a bus, but a collection of buses. So on, on the bus, there's power and ground down here, but you have I2C and serial, there's some extra pins, and then over on this side, you have spy. So you have those collections plus a few extra pins. Uh, this happens to be the RTC chip. And this underneath, this board is an adapter that allows one to take a click module and plug it into any of these four sides. So technically you could have four here. You have to be a little careful on the upper edge because the programming ports over here. So some click modules that use SPI, you don't want to connect in this area. Otherwise you have all of those. Uh, on the board that Ken keeps uh, showing off, the, the one that has my name on the bottom of it, the spacing between these are the same. So the click module will work over there as well. And uh, if we look into, uh, hopefully you can see my editor now. Beautiful. Okay. So, oh, this is, uh, oh, I actually started, I screwed that up, I, I took that out. What I've done, I think I may have shown this before, for, for the new people I've done is I've created a click template and I need to rename this. I obviously started here somewhere else. Um, so this is a template that I created for generic uh, click modules and with reminders of myself to do a save as. Uh, I think I'd, I was doing that and already discovered I had started that module. Um, all the normal stuff, testing, et cetera, et cetera. And then a way to kind of start to document how the click is being used. One of the things that I had to do because I, uh, despite having done all this stuff for a very long time, I misread these pins and I connected a transmit to a transmit and receive to receive, receive to receive, not a problem, but transmit to transmit can be. And I busted a pin on my brand new uh, board. So these are now correctly documented so that you don't miss that. The way that I'm approaching. Johnny, so, sorry to, what is a, what is a click a, adapter, a click board? Oh, uh, did you see this picture? Let me go back. Yeah, I saw the picture. I just don't know what the board does. Like, why, oh, why well, do there's that? a, there's hundreds of them. A thousand. There are a thousand. Yeah. And, and so they're generic hardware that you can attach to microcontrollers. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. For example, this one is an RTC. And so it uses the I2C pins and it uses an interrupt pin. Uh, most, most circuits won't in fact use the interrupt pins. So it's primarily the I2C. But for example, and I have a couple of the other objects that I've already written open. Some use SPY, some use RS, uh, the, the uh, standard serial. Um, so this generic bus, this, this dip pattern here is called the micro bus. And as I was just saying a minute ago, it's really a collection of buses. And they, the people at Microelectronica are just churning out module after module after module that they're, they're sticking on here. And so the idea was I started to create this template so that I could document everything uh, the nature of the way these connect into the propeller, what I've done is, you know, 
there's a base pin. Everything is an offset from that. Uh, since the, you, as you can see, here's the I2C serial, some digital and other pins, and the SPI bus. They're all in the same place on any given module uh, that happens to use them. And what I've done is I have, so I have some constants down here that name those offsets. So for example, if we look into the RTC, so here's the, the uh, RTC click object. And as you can see, what I've done is I, I've gone, th I've marked the pins that are used by the module as a, you know, as a way of documenting it and put some notes here. What I've decided to do, the code that I'm writing, I'm actually taking the microelectronica code and doing the best that I can to translate their C into spin so that people coming from other platforms have some familiarity. Um, underneath that are my standard libraries. So you can see, for example, in the, in the blank template, I, I have a whole bunch of objects in there. You won't use all of those. In fact, you generally just use one. But the idea is I put that into this template so that I can grab what I need for a given product, save it out and get rid of the rest. So that the case over here with the RTC, if you look into the objects it uses, it only needs the I2C connection because that's how we speak to that, that chip. And then all of them, all of the clicks because of their nature, the, their start object always, uh, start method rather, always has just a base pin um, setting. So you just have to know where you've plugged it in. And if you look, here's the demo code for that for that RTC, I have, my style of coding is that I put fixed IO pins, so I'm calling these the fixed IO pins on the P2. 56 and 57 aren't assigned to I2C, but I've decided in my own designs, that's where I'll put it if I do. And down here, what it is, these are where you could, by standard, you know, plug in click modules. And so in this case, I'm defining RTC basis click zero because I'm plugging it into click zero. As you, uh, oh, sorry, that's on the one that I have now. This one would have been click two because this is pin 32 over here. Sorry about that. Uh, at any rate, the, the start method is really easy. You just say start and your base pin. And this particular RTC is in fact running, if I pull up, can you see my uh, PST? We see the time and date. There it yep. is, yeah, so that's, that's funny. Too. Interestingly too, yeah, because this particular RTC has temperature built into it. Um, that modules you saw has a, has a battery on it. I had this thing unplugged until last night. It had been in the box for a couple of weeks since I'd written this code and plugged it in and it, it's still very close to, you know, I'm comparing it to my internet system. So the, the RTC is, really nice and accurate and obviously the battery backup works. So this, this particular click object that I've written has, uh, has the same names as what comes in the C code that you would get from Microelectronica. And uh, I, again, I did that just to help people that were going back and forth between the two. Um, so that's that. So here's the, we just looked at the I2C. There is a RS-485 board uh, this gave me trouble when I reversed these things, but now I've got it all working just fine. And so, as I was saying a minute ago, so here, this is using uh, this particular uh, uh, HD485 object, which does serial. Um, this is a case too, as Chip talked about smart pins, and um, one of the things that we do as programmers is make choices. I found for, for regular serial, the smart pins work really well. So for example, in my full duplex serial object that I use, I, I am doing this serial through the smart pins. So you can see the setup is all right here. But for half duplex 485, there's an additional pin to enable the transmitter that has to be enabled for a specific amount of time before you transmit. And you need to leave it on until you're finished transmitting. And what I, I found is it was just easier and a little less code um, to, to go ahead and um, let me do this F9, to just bit bang the serial um, for, for that. And you can see here's the assembly code. Now, those of you that aren't assembly programmers, don't get worried because this is already written and working. 
but you know, here's the code, for example, it's just this that shifts out, you know, that sends out a byte. It's very small and easy. So I don't have to worry about, oh, geez, is that, is that stuck in a smart pin buffer and is it not done? I don't have to think about any of that stuff. Uh, one of the things for those of you that are new, um, the P2 is a really, really fun way to learn assembly language because it's very clean and elegant and you can get a lot of work done in a tiny bit of code. It's, it's shocking how much code one can get done in, in just a few lines of assembly. It, it's, you know, that is a credit to Chip having been an assembly programmer for a very long time and having dealt with lots of bad assembly languages. He's, you know, why would he write one for himself? So, yes, ma'am? Um, when you brought up the temperature, Yes. Was that the temperature of the board or was that the ambient temperature around the board? That's inside the RTC. Okay. Yeah, that, that particular uh, RTC, Carolyn, is temperature compensated uh, so that, that it is very accurate with its, its timing. And, uh, and so they, you know, since it has temperature measurement inside, they allow you to pull it out. See what, so that's inside the chip, which you know, we looked at it, I think it was about 10 degrees above what my wall thermometer says the temperature in the room is. I, I grew up in the desert Southwest, so I'm, I tend to like warm temperatures. Um, let's see what that said. 28C is cool, cold. <laughs> uh, 28, that would be about, you know, 80-ish degrees, right? Yeah, 28C is quite warm. It's almost a summer oh, day. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you're talking about air and stuff yes. like that. Yeah. I was thinking the, yes. about I was thinking about thermal th thermal yeah, thermometers. <laughs> yeah, so here here's the board that I've got plugged in. So the temperature is coming out of out of the chip, which is running. You know, there's oscillator inside it running. And uh, and again, th this particular um, chip is accurate because it's temperature compensated. Finally, the, to go back to here, um, uh, there is uh, the other bus that gets used in, uh, on the micro bus is SPY. And so there are complementary modules, click modules. There's a four to 20 milliamp transmitter and a four to 20 milliamp receiver. They use the SPY. So, you know, here's a case where I'm using my SPY library and uh, you know this is pretty straightforward. You're 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 sending out a value, uh, gets converted to a current, and it, on the other side does the same thing. So it, it and this was kind of nice because I could plug, excuse me, the transmitter and the receiver into the board and connect wires between them and and say, okay, what you know, you send this, what am I getting on this side? It was very very simple. These are 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 straightforward. Question, John. Objects. Which RTC is, is it? Um, let me number. go back and look again. And um, so while he gets this, uh, as John mentioned, we have 20 plus clicks that we will have code like this for when we release the P2, but there are a thousand on DigiKeys and Mauser's website. And if you want to browse and see what's out there, you can go to Microelectronica or MicroE's website and uh, see what's available. But we just thought it'd be a really easy way to get working hardware in everybody's hands without designing a bunch of boards. That's a are. DS3231, Ken. There you have it. Jeff asked the question. Cool. You can put them on a discount if somebody orders a P2 board. Yes, we can. <laughs> I know a few people that might take me up on that offer. Okay, okay. we'll move on then. John, hey, thank you. I have a question. Okay. Yep. John, when you cross, when you connected the two TXs together, was what got killed? Was it the module? And, and what was it connecting to? Well, the, the, uh, I was connecting to what technically, it, what I call the receive on the RS-45, which is a driven oh, three volt okay. output. So it wasn't logic. No, no. So I had 3.3 volts going into my transmit pin, which was sitting, I, I, while it was sitting idle, there was no problem. But as soon as I tried to transmit something and the pin went low, it broke. Okay. So I'm probably at some point going to just make a little adapter for myself that has serious resistors while I'm developing code. Because, you know, accidents happen. I was really not happy about it happening, but you know, we you know, we all do it. So the trans so the the serial chip broke. It wasn't the propeller. No, the propeller broke. Oh, the propeller broke. Yeah. 
So what what kind of voltage was the pin exposed to then? 3.3. So I had a direct short between 3.3 and ground. <clears throat> because a transmit goes low on a start bit and and so that when that happened is when I think it, it busted the pin. Okay, well the propeller pins can handle, you know, driving against the other power rail in the highest output mode. It shouldn't hurt it. Do you think I, I can promise you it did. Hmm. Well, I wonder. Um, okay, well maybe, maybe we can talk about that later because that shouldn't okay. happen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks John. Okay. Okay, um, while we wait for Team Oz to get queued up, um, next week, I believe you're looking at uh, right now Flex Basic and um, Aboard, are you? Okay. Um, yeah, so Eric Smith next week will present on this. Um, FlexProp does basic spin and C, and this is the first basic program I ever wrote on the propeller with this morning, and it blinks an LED. So um, you can actually bring in spin objects too and drive displays and do way more advanced stuff. So Eric's going to show that to us next week. All right, so we'll go down under and wake Thanks, up Team Oz. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for your quick start guide too, which will appear on our new website. It looks great. I followed it and it worked. Good stuff. Thanks, Ken. Um, my name's Lachlan. Um, I'm also here with Brian, who is OzProp on the forums. Um, I'm Tubular on the forums. Um, we've got a couple of members of uh, Team Oz in inverted commas who um, it's a bit early for them to be here. So Roger, uh, who is Roger Lowe on the forums, has also done a lot of the MicroPython compilation. Um, we're going to talk today about some new and current developments on MicroPython. Um, some of you will have seen our earlier presentations. We did one uh, back in July, July 23rd, where we went into a lot of the detail of how to um, interactively work with the uh, MicroPython system. And that was based around version 1.11 of the MicroPython system, which is you know, probably about six months out of date at that point. Um, what we're announcing today, we're, we're currently now right up to date and using 1.13, 1.13 um, um, of MicroPython. So that means we are um, almost at our goal of merging in with the mainline MicroPython um, system. It means that uh, the functions and the code and all that is right up to date with how MicroPython envis envisage um, the, uh, the system being used. Um, we, a little bit perhaps about the MicroPython background. Um, it's a fast growing implementation of Python 3. It gives you a lot of um, uh, the benefits of uh, Python 3 um, code. Um, it's very friendly for uh, propeller and um, basic stamp programs in that it's got a REPL system. Um, those of you who've had like Apple IIs or Commodores or any of those systems back in the 80s, that you would have had a sort of an interactive system where you can type commands in and see the results of your your um, your, your work um, you know straight up and MicroPython is like that in that it gives you that instant feedback and that instant gratification about when you're uh, when you when you're assembling your code together. Um, it's a whole lot of fun to um, to, to work with. The, we believe it's a very good match for the Propeller Two ecosystem because we have one. Um, well, first of all, it permits you know nice rapid application development, um, but the blend of having one master MicroPython cog, which has uh, got you know most of hub memory available, plus the seven helper cogs, lets you do a whole lot of unique things, which are um, um, very helpful. So we can have that MicroPython cog running and doing its normal REPL thing, which is a similar experience to what you might get on other systems. But on the Propeller 2, we can augment that with, um, with video and USB keyboard and all these other things concurrently. And those, due to the eight core nature of the Propeller 2, aren't going to impact or slow down MicroPython. They're going to augment and support it. Now, I'm going to cut across here and hopefully I can just show a snippet from the earlier video of MicroPython um, 1.11. And we'll just highlight this video is from 
Um, sorry, I've just got to change the video source here. So this was from July the 23rd and the YouTube video is up on the, um, the, the Parallax Inc. YouTube channel. Um, I've just got to change the video source. And okay, so can you, you see just share your video? <clears throat> Sorry. Share your video. Oh, yeah, let's do that. That'll be better. Okay, so this is the um, Parallax Inc. YouTube channel from July 23rd and in about 40 minutes and thereabouts in you'll see where we're using MicroPython version 1.11 and if we just zoom forward a little bit you'll see us editing code on the MicroPython, uh, on, on self-hosted MicroPython um, and this is a result of being able to actually output the video from the P2 system and capture that. Um, so we're actually able to edit code on the system and um, you know display the application output code. We're also able to, um, we can also see some memory maps here when we find it, and here. So we can also see like a live memory map. Um, all these features are made possible due to the fact we've got, you know, these seven helper cogs in addition to the, um, um, in addition to the main micropathing cog. And Yeah, so that's the, um, the the sort of the benefits, I guess, of having a propeller two with seven cogs, which we can load up with the CPU method, which is proposed by Eric and worked on uh, by Roger, and that allows you to spawn additional um, cogs, which currently can be sort of C basic um, or PASM two, and we are just working on the spin two integration part of that. So you'll also be able to work with spin two cogs. There's a few um, sort of memory gymnastics which we are. Uh, we are getting right. Um, so I just have to go back to normal video. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so some of the benefits of MicroPython. If you haven't seen what we've been doing, we've been working on MicroPython for around 18 months, um, Brian and myself and Roger as well. Um, and so there are some videos which go back over that period of time. There's probably now half a dozen or thereabouts which show um, P2, you know, doing real MicroPython stuff live with the P2 actually outputting the video. And, um, and so it's pretty exciting from, from our point of view. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what's new in MicroPython 1.13. So this is as compared to the uh, three months ago when we were on 1.11. Um, it's got, um, a lot of work being done on the pin constants. We've moved a lot of the IO from being based on the Pi board ecosystem across to the machine uh, ecosystem. That's a largely cosmetic change, but it means things are right up to date in the way forward with MicroPython. Um, it, we've used, where possible, the, um, the constants from the P2 um, spin 2 documentation uh, that, which means you're only going to have to learn sort of one set of constants. I just need to um, see if I can bring this constant list up. We'll do that later. Um, so there's, you know, I could, um, I don't know, 50 or so constants which allow you to configure the pins. The pins on the propeller too have got a really wide variety of uh, IO capabilities. Um, you can have pull-up resistors of three different values. You can set current sources. You can do that independently for pull up and pull down. You've got four different DAC impedances. You can run the DACs and the ADCs at the same time. It's really a sort of best in class IO. Um, and of course that's built into every single pad. And so with MicroPython, um, you gain all those benefits of being able to have um, any pin doing, doing anything. And that's highly unusual for, uh, for um, other micros. Um, we are currently in the process of bringing the documentation up to date. So in order to get on the mainline MicroPython thing, we are um, getting our documentation. There's a quick reference, uh, sorry, a quick start reference. There is a general hardware reference 
and there is a tutorial for um, getting started with MicroPython on P2. All those are being worked on actively and they will appear on uh, GitHub very soon and will of course provide links across to um, some, some similar material which will be on the Parallax um, website and um, the getting started is pretty straightforward. Um, we've made it hopefully nice and easy to, uh, to get going. Um, we welcome feedback if you know anyone gets stuck on, on any of the points, we'll make sure it's nice and smooth for people to get through. Um, we do recommend people put the MicroPython into the flash of the board. Um, MicroPython resets frequently and that just makes sure that you have a, a, um, a useful, oh, it, it just makes it more um, user friendly compared to say loading from, uh, from SD card, which takes you know, five or 10 times as long as the flash, the flash system. Right, so I don't want to talk too long. I might, um, we're going to plug into a real system here and, and Brian might uh, run a couple of his demos. Um, we've just got to rearrange a few things here. Um, I suppose before we do that, are there any questions on what, I, what I've talked about? Any, um, any uh, questions about the, the MicroPython system or how we use it with P2? Yeah, John, yeah, Un unmute. So. Uh. Yeah, Lachlan, when, you know, I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a spin programmer. I like that. It's very easy. I can write the code, download it. You know, I can press F11 and it goes into the flash and I'm done. If I want to develop in MicroPython, which I do, do I have the same kind of process where I can develop and then the next time I power up the board, it will just run my application uh, as opposed to going into a REPL? Yeah, there, there are ways of achieving this with MicroPython. Um, you know, there's a main.py which loads up when MicroPython loads, and so it can call and import um, code from uh, the Flash chip. And also, um, we will be able to ultimately do this from other um, sources. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later because there's also some changes on MicroPython where it's gaining little FS support. Um, at the moment, we've got a nice self-contained system, which just means, uh, which, which Brian designed, which allows us to, um, uh, you know, have where leveling in the flash and store files in the flash and kind of load things in. So it feels a bit like an old school computer. You know, you've got the, you've got things sort of um, in a sort of a non-volatile memory there and you can edit stuff super fast. You can use USB keyboard and, and monitor and plug that in and away you go. Um, so yeah, there's a, it's a kind of a, maybe a slightly different experience to what we've been corrupted with with PCs over the recent years, you know, where we've got a, a large multi gigabyte IDE, um, you know, which, which, um, is on the PC thing, not, not talking about parallax or or any of those kind of things, which are a little bit more lean and efficient, but I'm talking about the, you know, the broader, um, uh, MicroPython and, and, and other, you know, micro systems, they've got large IDEs. So we wanted to get back to something which is, um, self-hosted, understandable, uh, quick, um, just lean and, and efficient, the same way that, you know, writing code for the P2 is, um, yeah, so. Nice. A any other questions before we move on to some demos? Okay. All right, so I'll put, we'll change the video across to the real thing. Um, this is now gonna be, Right, so you won't be able to see me, but hopefully um, you can see the MicroPython version 1.13 prompt. You might have to share video again. No, I think it's on. Uh, we're it. seeing it. Looks good. Looks good. Okay. Take it away, Brian. Okay. So what you can see at the moment, everyone can hear me okay? Oh, we can hear you, but your video is taken over the other screen. I will uh, spot uh, that video. Okay, did it come back now? Now you That's see better. it. Okay. Yeah, it's back. All right, Brian. Yes, we've got here is the, the standard rep um, that's being output on VGO. So the um, you've still got the serial output. Uh, so if you're, you're running, running MicroPython, you can run it through a terminal. Okay, and Brian, before you go any further, make sure the speakers are, so I take you guys are in the same room, so make sure the speakers are off on the other setup you had. All right. And um, mute that other mic, and I think you'll be good to go. You're getting an echo there? 
I think we're still getting two of you. Can you hear okay? Yeah, I can hear okay. Okay, I can't, but you go. You, you, you're on. Is that, Is that better, Ken? Um, we get a little bit of reverb. Anyone have any ideas on that? Maybe check, uh, go down to your audio settings on Zoom. It's probably Lachlan's mic. Lachlan's mic? Okay, mute yourself, Lachlan. I got him muted. Okay. All right. Now try, Brian. Is that better now? 100%. Okay. All right. So the, um, the output from MicroPython, um, while it's coming out on the VGA, it's also coming out on the serial terminal as well. Um, so basically, the video driver is just listening in on the anything that's output from the uh, serial side. It's intercepting that traffic and it's it's copying it basically out onto the the video screen. So um, you, you've got the best of both worlds, and you, there's no configuration you have to do. This is just automatic. It's just running that way. Um, now, because this is um, it's also got some self-hosted uh, capability in it. Um, I can, uh, using the USB keyboard that's hooked up, um, I'm jumping straight in here to a, a, this is a file manager, if you want to call it that. So I've got various files that I've, I've got sitting in flash memory and um, I can select a file and we're now in the, uh, a full screen uh, editor so I can jump around and um, you can see it's got some basic syntax highlighting in there and I can, um, do you know, basic editing, all sorts of um, deletes. Um, so it's pretty much a, a, an editor. It's not a complete editor. There's a few things that still need to be added in, but there's enough there that you can uh, type your code and you can save it to the file system, and uh, then you can you can send it out and send it uh, straight back into MicroPython and run it. Now the question that um, Johnny Mac asked there before is from this. Uh, when you save a file to the file system, there's, there's a boot file um, and you can put file names into that. And when you do a reset, MicroPython will load those files into MicroPython and execute them. So um, you can have a, a standalone um, system that when you power it up, it'll, it'll run whatever the code is that you have set. And, um, but from the, the REPL, if I, if I go back to the, uh, the REPL, I'll just escape out of that. Back to the, the REPL there. Um, there's some commands that you can actually do from the REPL that accesses the file system. Now, I, you can see I used a backtick command there and files. Now, this is a non standard MicroPython uh, command. This is something that we've, we've added on top of MicroPython. This is just to access our um, file system. Um, but it allows you to load files, delete files, and view the files that you've got sitting in the, on the flash. Um, now, the plan is now that little file system is being added into version 1.13, um, is to eventually move across from my file flash system across into the, the official um, little FS, which is um, a little bit more robust than the system I've got for wear leveling and, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's a work in progress. Um, so yeah, so that's the basic, um, I, I suppose, framework that we've got going is that you've, you've got your standard MicroPython, but we've added, a, a, I suppose, a P2 facade on top of that, which gives you your USB keyboard, uh, VGA, and, and at the moment we've got the flash file system and editor on it. So. Um, it's a self-hosted system. But if you don't want to use it as a self-hosted system, you can disable the video and the USB and um, you can just use it through a serial terminal. And um, there is a facility that's um, not quite finished yet that you can actually load in um, PASM code and launch COGS um, loading files from the flash file system straight into a cog and launch those separately. Um, that's not quite finished yet. Um, and ultimately, um, would, it'd be nice to be able to actually assemble um, PASM code as well, but um, there's a little bit more work to do that. Um, so yeah, that's basically where we're at at the moment. Um, 
there's a few things that still need to be um, sorted out, jumping from the version 1.11 to version 1.13. Um, but there's a couple of things that I broke that I need to fix. Um, but we're getting there. There's signs of life, and um, we're, we're very, very close. So, Brian, uh, any a bunch of questions coming up. Um, one of them is about leveraging code made elsewhere. Actually, it's a couple of them. So um, how will we be able to do that or can we? So if there's some MicroPython code for ESP32 or driving NeoPixels or, or anything, what do you foresee the usefulness of that being? Um, the only differences you'll have there is the, the differences in the IO between the P2 and the ESP32. Um, the, this new version where we've moved a lot of the uh, IO commands across to this machine class, um, we're, we're trying to make it that it's standardized to the MicroPython model. Um, beforehand, the earlier stuff we were doing, the, even some of the naming conventions weren't the same as uh, some of the ESP and earlier versions of MicroPython. So we've now tried to standardize that. and. Um, yeah, there'll be a few things that you, the behavior will be slightly different when setting the IO pins. Um, but a lot of that stuff shouldn't be too hard to port across. Um, the I squared C and SPY um, stuff uh, Roger's been working on, and that's now going to be integrated in as it would be in the ESP32 versions. So, yeah, soft I squared C. So a lot of the um, basic IO stuff should port across fairly fairly easily. There might be a slight name change perhaps to do with uh, your pull up resistor uh, modes and things like that that may be needed. Um, but generally we're, we're trying to stick to the, the conventional uh, names. Um, so porting shouldn't be too hard. And have you sorted out a way to run um, objects in other COGS or Python scripts? Um, not yet. That's a lot more complicated to do that. Um, at the moment, we've we've just got the uh, PASM stuff running in other cogs. Um, yeah, there's a little bit more work, or a lot more work actually, in, in getting um, Python running on other cogs as well. Because uh, unfortunately, each um, VM of uh, Python requires its own heap, um, and you start consuming you rob from one to get another one to work. And so there's a balancing act there that would be required. Um, but it but, seems um, between the uh, the smart pin functionality and then the fact you put some of this in other cogs already, we yep. may not have huge demand. So it's almost like MicroPython gets presented with a feature set of capabilities. Like, yeah, because we're already finding that there's a lot of things you can do, especially with the smart pins. Um, for example, if you're, you're running um, servos, um, you're pretty much just setting the smart, the smart pin up in a, a servo mode, or it's actually a, a triangle, a sawtooth PWM mode. Um, and you can actually have servos running and you can still be in the REPL. Um, you're not actually running in a main loop um, to maintain and, and output these pulse trains. So there's a lot of things that you can do now that it take, completely takes the load off the main MicroPython loop. Um, especially generating you know, NCO frequency modes and, and this sort of thing. Um, and, and it means that, that you're not actually clobbering the main speed and the main loop of MicroPython. And, and with, with all these IO that we've got, um, especially even with things like um, your analog, um, you want to read um, you know, pots or sensors or whatever, um, you're just setting up smart pins to, to read an analog voltage. and all you have to do is MicroPython just, there's an, there'll be an analog um, command and you just read the values. Um, so there's a lot of um, the heavy lifting has been taken off the main MicroPython loop because of the smart pins. So complementing that with some uh, PASM running in other COGS as well, um, you, you may not need to, to run um, other instances of MicroPython uh, because all the work's already been done for you. Good, good. Okay. And also um, should be pointed out that uh, the early version I have run of this was actually run on 
this tool on Mew. So for those who ah, yes. want the self-hosted version with the VGA display and the keyboard and the mouse or whatever, can also do it um, the way they've been programming things like the micro bit, right? That's right. Yeah. And we've got a feature that from Mew, you can, if you want to use that as your editor, um, you can just type your code and I've got a, another um, backtick command that you can just put at the top of your code. And when you hit the run button from Mew, um, if you've got this uh, function put in, it will um, save the file to flash at the same time. Um, so you've got the capability of, of saving your files from Mew into flash into the MicroPython as well, similar to what you would do on an ESP32 or a microbit um, board. Um, so yeah, we, we've added that layer into it. So some of these um, backtick commands are uh, commands that are intercepted um, by our stuff and they're not actually passed to MicroPython itself. Um, we're doing some other tricks behind the scene. And so as far as Mew's concerned, it's just sent a file out. And, um, but at the P2 end, we're intercepting that and we're, we're triggering it to save it out to, to flash so you can use it in the, in the future. So the, the setup process consists of getting the interpreter and then putting it in um, flash or SD card? Uh, in, flash is, in flash is a better way to go um, to, to have the, the key micropython stuff um, and um, you can actually boot from SD if you've got your file on SD. Um, the boot time is a lot slower um, than what it is from flash and that where that's a problem is if you're in Mew for example and you're switching into REPL mode in Mew um, there's quite a delay um, it does a re reset of the, the board and it has to reload from the SD card so there's it's not as snappy response as if it is if it's on the booting from flash. But if you want to take advantage of the flash file system, um, you, you, you can't have SD and flash at the same time because they use the same pins. Um, so you have to decide if you're going to run from SD, uh, you don't have the advantage of the, uh, and the, or the flash file system. Great. Okay. So let's get some more questions. If you were typed in, anybody um, have anything in particular they want to ask? Yeah, I was wondering whether or not uh, you guys were a 32-bit or 64-bit system. In other words, can you do 64-bit integer math? Uh, in it has an extended integer math, so you can have massive integers. Um, you, you can do, um, I think I, in one of my old demos, I, I was doing factorials of like a thousand and you get a result of 5,000 digits. Um, so yeah, my, Python itself does ha actually have a long integer mode that's automatically it switches over to it when the results go over 32 bits. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so it sounds like the schedule, the, the goal is that when we launch the P2, we will have a quick start guide for this. That's the plan. Yeah, that's correct. It's really wonderful, uh, Team Oz. You guys have done so much work and we all appreciate it. I'm really interested in this for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that obviously the educational audience that we serve so well, um, they're using MicroPython like crazy on the micro bit. So they'll be enthused about this. And then also um, Mew and your self-hosted tools give us a way out of Windows, um, yep. which is a bit of a problem for us sometimes. <laughs> sure. And Brian, yeah, just, just to verify, all that stuff you were showing was actually VGA being output by the propeller, right? That's right, yep. So yeah, so for people listening, the significant, significant thing here is that this is self-hosting. It's not using a PC or anything, but it has its own little life. Yeah, that's right. So I've just got a VGA plugged in and a USB keyboard. And I'm using Gary J's uh, USB driver that's from the forum. And um, yeah, that, it all just integrates together. I don't know if you can see that video there now of the, the board. 
So yeah, there's no no PC um, required. It's completely self-hosted. Super. Any more questions for Team Oz before we let them return to bed? <laughs> yeah, what time is it there? Um, what is it, eight? Nine thirty in the morning now. Yeah. Oh, okay, oh. you're okay now. You're all right. Yeah, but my day started at five o'clock this morning. <laughs> Which monitor do you have that plugged into? Uh, it's, uh, VGA. Uh, it's just a PC monitor that it's plugged into at the moment. Okay. But but we've got a uh, like a video capture setup going at the moment as well. Great, and it's nice you've been able to work with Damien on this too. That he's in your neighborhood. Yes, and now we're out of lockdown officially yesterday. That, that makes things a bit easier as well. And it seems too that um, the path of using the original micro Python code and the revisions that come out of it is probably a benefit to us long term. Um, one, one person, Matt, brought up CircuitPython, which we've looked at. But these two bases, I imagine, diverge at some point and we're, we're staying close to the core. Yeah, uh, I suppose we have a loyalty to the uh, the main line of MicroPython. Um, and but it's probably easier for us too because Damien is in our neighbourhood. Um, if we get into trouble, um, we can't get much higher than going to the main author. Isn't that the truth? And also, T. Moz, Lachlan, um, at the last P2 Live Forum, shared some hardware efforts that you are developing too. So there will be hardware coming out of T. Moz with MicroPython in mind. That's right. I'm not sure if Lachlan's got a picture of it here somewhere. Yeah, if you guys want to show a picture okay. of that before we move on. Yeah, I on. think he's, cool. he's working on something now. Yeah, we're, we're not getting his audio. We can't hear you. They can't hear you. <laughs> Maybe you can describe it. <laughs> yeah. So he, you can see the little cases that he's holding up. And there's the little board. Nice. Hey, isn't that weird that wires come through those, those slots? Sorry, what was that, Chip? Is the idea that the wires would come through those slots? Um, yeah, that's one idea. And also things like um, if with LED indicators and things, you can actually see them through the, yeah. through the slots. But also from a cooling point of view as well, if you're going to push it hard like we do quite often, um, the, the thing can breathe. Is that 3D printed the case? Um, no, that's a commercially available case. Oh. Um, I think Lachlan might even have the part number for it. Was it a digi key mouser? Uh, yeah, okay. Hammond 51 V2. Okay. But we can put up on the uh, the chat the part numbers. But yeah, and I think they're available in three different colours: the black, white, and the um, neutral colour, and grey. So, so there, there's a couple of the cases he's holding there now. I'll still try to print my own. <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian and Lachlan, thanks so much. And uh, no worries. if we have more questions for these guys and they're still around, we can circle back um, and we'll keep, keep on moving here. Sure. Okay, uh, so the next thing is um, before we move to Chip, we'll make a um, pit stop here. Are you looking at my uh, P2 Edge and the Johnny Mac board? So let me give me a thumbs up. For some reason, this program doesn't give me the green outline, so I don't know if yep, it's being shared. Okay. It. Thanks, Roy. Okay, um, so a question came up from Aaron sent me privately about the, the longevity of the P2 eval platforms and pin layout. So you've seen the demo board and here you're looking at the Johnny Mac board and you'll see the connectors are the same. 
and they're, they're sequenced the same so that you can plug on here. Just a minute, gotta do a little bit of muting out there somewhere. Okay, sorry, Timos. Um, you'll see that these connectors are the same, so they'll accept the P2 accessory set or the click adapters in four different locations. So this is a consistent format, and it will be with us for years to come, probably 10 years or more. Um, or if it's like the basic stamp, these boards might persist for 25 or 30 years. Well, Tim, there will never be any reason to change it. I mean, once we set this up, there's not any reason to do anything different for this kind of idea. So I think it would just stay for the whole life of the product. Awesome. Okay. Music to my ears, considering the PCB setup charges and stuff. Okay, so we're looking at the um, P2 Edge breakout board. And where we're going with this is the special offer of the day. And this board was actually envisioned by Johnny Mac. So it is adorned with his signature on the back. Pretty nice. And here's the uh, P2 Edge. So I'll give you a close look on that if I can find the zoom on my document camera. Then we're going to talk about um, a few things. Okay, I don't totally like the focus of that. Ah, there it comes. Okay, so this is the P2 Edge, and this is the first run, and we have built up about 70 of these. We are planning on building 500. It has one minor deficiency, which early adopters can handle, but um, would be an issue for the general public. Specifically, these pins on the right, and Chip can speak to this. If Bill, you can, we, need to, we need to cut those pins before we ship that thing out. Okay, well, <laughs> we, we've bagged these, and so the early adopters will just want to be sure they plug it in the right way to the P2 Edge breadboard. But, but Ken, if we you make a little them? jig, we could just nick those, or even an X-Acto knife would just completely take the danger okay. away. So, yeah, um, just by cutting right here, is that right? Yeah, just cut right across there. What happened was we had these pins mirrored such that if we – we had some, how would we say, reverse polarity protection uh, for the incoming voltage on the board. So reverse polarity wouldn't hurt it, but we were not thinking straight when we built it. So what happened was when we plug it in backwards, it was exposing pins 36 and 37 to what turned out to be minus 5 volts because ground became attached to 5 volts. And then those two other pins got grounded in that scenario. So they had negative five volts on them and it, it, it caused latch up. It just, well, it didn't cause latch up, it just blew the pin out. And, uh, but we can, so on the new boards we're gonna make, we're gonna sever those two pins there. They're not gonna be connected to ground on the front anymore. And that'll totally take the problem away. So that when that board gets reversed, five volts will go to those two pins that are no connects and it will be no problem. But anyway, yeah, Ken, we should unbag them and, and uh, Try to come up with a way to consistently uh, cut those traces that's not problematic. We've only got 60 of them, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, we need to do that. So it just completely right. takes the danger away, and then you'll have what we're going to be shipping in the future. Okay, so wrong way would be plugging it in this way, and then right way is as shown. So I've been using it this way fine for the past couple days. Okay, so so we have these um, 70 boards, and they have this little problem. And we ordered new ones, but it takes a long time to get things restarted. <laughs> I mean, once we tear down the pick and place, wait for circuit boards, up to a month can pass, even when we're pushing things along. So knowing that there are many enthusiastic users here who we want to um, get going, we came up with a plan, which we think you might like. And it works like this. We have a special offer. And that special offer consists of the following. You can get the P2 Edge for 29 bucks and a Johnny Mac board for $29 while supplies last and we're not putting this out publicly we're just putting it here for the early adopters we know you can all handle this um, 
and would be happy with this like I have been. So these two things are now for sale in our web shop starting now. And I'm gonna paste the links in in case you wanna go grab them today. So you'll notice for the, and, and by the way, these links are not publicly visible. You have to have them, okay? So if you have the links, you can go there and add these to your cart at these prices and you'll get free shipping because it's over $50. Sorry, down under and Euros owners, it does not apply for free shipping. I'm sorry, but you can choose USPS for that, okay? And that should be like 10, 20 bucks. So um, help yourself. We have 60 or 70 of the P2 edges and then we have currently shown in our web shop for the Johnny Mac and I'll just uh, show you. It says 19. That's because one of you just already bought them, but there were 25. So we have 40 more coming into stock. We're just sending them through the selective solder machine right now. Um, so there's hardly, you know, it just shows as 19. So don't pay attention to that. And then the P2EC, as you will see, is right here. And there's 72 of those. Okay, so this way we can get started, um, get to work while time passes. So those two things. Um, what else might you need? You might like to get a prop plug. 32201, our part number. Okay, and then the other thing is, and we're just gonna throw this in because we have them in stock, but they're not shown on our website. So if you buy a Johnny Mac board, you will also get one of these because you need to provide five volts, no more, no less to this board. There is a handy USB to 2.1 ID or 2.5 millimeter OD jack, which can plug into the uh, board, okay? And you can also now go shopping for little, um, AC to DC converter packs for phone charging, for quick charging phones that provide up to three amps. And those are available on Amazon too. So these we have in stock. So if you order Johnny Mac, we're gonna put this in there, um, although it's not actually on our website. So we'll be adding those in tomorrow. Um, other things about this. So you'll see a sticker on the back of your boards, looks like that. Okay, and then yeah, the prop plug. So I suggest you get one of those. And uh, I'll give you a link to, I don't think you need a link to this, but I'll paste it anyway. And this is the adapter I've been using, the, the 3-amp. So if you go shopping, you can also get, um, at this point, if you're really getting into this, the P2 accessory set, all right, um, plugs onto the board. So here's the, some of the adapters you've seen today. And then unfortunately it's not shown yet, will be on the new website is the board to click adapter and the board to WX module adapter. By the way, Ken, those two uh, products, the Edge and the Lachlan uh, Johnny Mac board are showing up in the new products page on the store. <laughs> okay. The public. Good to know. I probably won't uh, spend time sorting out the why with that. But um, as you see the stock go down on the Johnny Mac board, just know tomorrow it'll be replenished. So you'll kind of have to keep track of these links on your own. Um, they're for you guys and enjoy. Was a special offer worth waiting around for? Okay. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, we'd rather <laughs> just give them to you, but at least this way we could recoup a little bit of costs and it's so important to us to keep all of you inspired um, and we appreciate everything that's getting done around the propeller too. What's, yeah, what's I think the, I missed um, the links. Okay, I'll paste them back in. What, what's the expected um, uh, piece cost? Like once we're in full production on the P2, what, what are you expecting to be charging for the P2? Yeah, yeah great question. Um, okay, so all four of those links are pasted in the Johnny Mac, P2 Edge, and then the prop plug, then the other two links are in case you need them. So the expected price of the Propeller 2 chip goes from 10 to 14.95, depending on quantity, but it's a steep curve. So 
once you get like 90, which is the trade quantity, our, our cost, our price to the customer goes down somewhere $12. And we can share all that stuff next week too. It's all done. And then the P2 edges are going to sell at 49 down to $32 or so if you get 100 of them. If you Which integrate it in the product. Okay. Which link is for the Johnny Mac? That would be 64020. Okay, I see it. <laughs> John is laughing. <laughs> People are clicking on you, John. You, you can feel it, you can't guys you? You can just go to the Parallax shop store, click on new products, and both the items are there. Okay, I didn't find it, but I didn't click on new products. There we go. They're also under the sale portion. Okay. Yeah. And I don't think others will really wander in there right now and buy all these up anyway. Oh, I gotta know beat all the at. other people that are on this link. <laughs> well, this is habit for you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And the documentation too for these is there. It's in draft form and it's a link to a Google Doc. So using the P2EC as an example. Okay, this is preliminary subject to change. But uh, you can get a look at that too. So Chip, did I miss anything important here? No, I don't think so. You know, about our chip cost, I know this is high for what people expect chips to cost, but the trouble is our cost is high because the silicon on that thing is huge. It's like, I think it's 8.7 by 8.5 millimeters, the die is. Uh, if we were to go to a, tighter process we could get that way down of course but really the analog wouldn't shrink we're going to be kind of um i forget what the term is but when you're you're pad ring pad ring limited is what we are um but anyway let me just do eight point uh, is it is it 7.8 by 7.5 it's about I remember it's like about 70 it's, it's over eight on both dimensions, about 72 millimeters, 72 square millimeters of silicon, which is a lot. I mean, a lot of these microcontrollers today are probably like two square millimeters of silicon, but because we have so much stuff in parallel that, you know, if you don't program it, it doesn't get used, um, but it's there if you need it. Our silicon is just big and it costs a lot. And, Anyway, there's not much we can do about that, but hopefully, you know, the value is there and people can, you know, use the chip to advantage. The cost doesn't seem outrageous to I, me. It's perfectly reasonable, to be honest. We're, we're in the era now of like 20 cent 32-bit microcontrollers from China. But on the other hand, the multi-core chips on DigiKey catalog are right where we are. Okay, yeah. Our, our cost, hey, Chip. Yeah. Chip, the bigger, the better. We will, we will pay for it. I wish it was cheap, but it just, it, 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 there's like 32 million transistors in that chip. Most of them are memory, of course. Um, yeah. And that's small by modern standards, but for a 180 nanometer technology chip, that's a lot, that's a lot of transistors. You betcha. Not really fair to compare yourself to the 20 cent 32 bit micros either. They are okay. way, nowhere near as capable as the P2. Exactly. I hope not. Okay. Um, Chip, should we move into the visual debugging tools you've got? Sure. Okay. And then also there's a request. I don't know if Stephen Morocco wants to share any progress on his LED driver board, but that was really so cool last week. A lot of us <laughs> are still thinking about it. <laughs> Steve's got it rocking. <laughs> Maybe after Chip, if you're still in. Oh, I've seen Johnny Mac has one now. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right, Chip. All right. So uh, most of you guys know that we have some um, kind of one-way debug stuff where the chip, uh, while it's running code, can send out uh, data over the serial pin, and then it gets um, reeled into the PC. And then on the, uh, in our Windows app, we um, divine all kinds of stuff from that. And we can make all sorts of displays. We can make all kinds of uh, oscilloscopes and spectrographs and FFTs and plotters and terminals and all kinds of stuff. So the idea is that uh, this stuff allows you to 
uh, visualize data. And um, maybe it can go further than that eventually. But for now, I, I've always wanted something that would let me see kind of graphically what's going on with, with code as it runs. Um, so I've had, I think we have about nine different debug displays now. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I was kind of looking at it, thinking how it's too bad that it was so coarse looking for the lines, you know, because as, as you draw a line, there's a lot of aliasing that goes on where, uh, you know, you have to step maybe a couple X pixels and jump up a Y, go a few more X's, and you have all the staircase step in, in the graphics. And it's uh, it, it actually with, with high color depth like we have today, we can get, a, we can get around that through anti-aliasing. So I went out, I've been on this like two week odyssey of getting into anti-aliasing. And I'm convinced you could probably spend a year working on this. It's, uh, it's like the hardest thing I've done in, in, in recent memory. Is this really tough? And, it, and I wouldn't have figured out, I wouldn't have really had any breakthrough if I didn't have to sit down in the ER for like five hours with a clipboard. I was having some pain, you know, from a few weeks ago. And I thought I was having like a recurring appendicitis because that can happen where they might remove your appendix, but there's a little nub there that can reinfect and cause you all kinds of problems. So I didn't want to like go septic and croak. So I had been uh, to the doctor one day and the next day I went up to this ER to get a CT scan. So I had to wait around there. It turns out I just have kidney stones. It's no big deal. So I can handle pain, but I don't, it's, as long as I know I'm probably not going to die, I'm okay with that. I've had kidney stones before, but anyway, I had to sit there for five hours and I had a clipboard and I worked out a scheme for, uh, in fact, maybe I could show you. I wanted to make a little graphical using the, uh, a little graphic just depiction of how this works um, using the plot in debug, but I haven't had the time. Let me see, I've got a bunch of graph paper. I took a bunch of graph paper with me and uh, I worked out this thing. I, I think if I had not been stuck in that chair, I wouldn't have mustered the concentration to get through this, but I figured out how to anti-alias curved edges. And here, let's see, this is kind of crude, but this is what a line looks like on the screen, right? It gets pixelated. But you can see those rough edges. So what you want to do is you want to uh, alpha blend the partial pixels where you have partial coverage of a pixel with the shape you want to draw. You want to figure out what the area is for that pixel and then use that as, a, as an alpha blend ratio to blend against the background. And uh, anyway, I had this I had to work this thing out. It was so hard, man, but I, but I, got, it, I got something figured out that works pretty well. Um, basically, I, I don't really have anything that explains it that's going to be very visible. Which is all kinds of trouble, like, how do you show, let me see, where is this? Look at that. I mean, what can you do with that to figure out how much of each pixel to light up? And what about, you know, can you, can you do this? Can you reduce it to, like, triangles and trapezoids to try to get the volume, you know, to get the computation down? So it's really hard. I mean, obviously, you could go the long route and just really mathematically break it down and compute volumes or areas and uh, do it that way. But that's not at all practical for line drawing. You have to have something that uh, is very, very simple. The inner loop of the line draw has to be nothing more than adds and compares and things like that. You, there's no time to do trig. Anyway, I figured out in the end, what you can do is if you have a, an arching uh, edge, what you can do is take and in the case of a circle or oval, you have two axis symmetry. So you really only need to worry about one quarter of a revolution, right? So if you say we have this range and domain where we're gonna have a curve, and for each X, you figure out what the Y is at that X, right? And it's gonna be somewhere, it's gonna be a fractional pixel. It's gonna go so far into some pixel. So you compute what your X's are for each Y, and then you compute what your Y's are for each X. And you wind up with just two tables. But what you do is you look at the, the logical and of those two. And there you get your uh, very simple. You wind up just computing uh, just a simple multiply gives you what the uh, alpha blend ratio needs to be for that pixel. And I wanted to make a little plot animation to show because it's, it's like really simple. I mean, kindergartner could understand it, but it just about killed me figuring it out. 
But now that I've got that working, well, that, that was tough. And then I went into line draw. In the line draw, trying to draw pixels with a registration of a 256th of a pixel. So imagine drawing any point on a screen with eight sub bits per pixel as far as your endpoint locations go. And it's actually for the, uh, for the main part of the line draw, it's pretty simple, but it gets a little complex at the endpoints. Anyway, I got that all worked out. And, uh, and I finished that yesterday and it's, it's decent. You know, there's, there's one thing I could do to make it a little bit better, but it would take a lot more work and I'm gonna let it ride for now. But I've got, you know, and it's an endpoint issue. It's not the main line issue, but the endpoint issue. So I'll share my screen here. Let's see, share screen. Uh, okay, can you see these things? Yes, I can. Yeah, we can see yep. them. Okay. Got it. Let's see, my, my window otherwise just got really small. Okay, well, if you can see that, what you see there are two uh, lines, right? And they are, I've had to place now, the, the line draw capability is, it can go to a 256 of a pixel for each endpoint, but when I adapt it to plot, I have to have the endpoints, you know, be integral numbers of pixels because that's how things get expressed. Um, but for the, for the like uh, waveform viewing for uh, the FFT and the scope, I can actually register the lines at 256 of a pixel. But for plot, I had to go. That's why you see the endpoints kind of like jumping in and out as they move around. They're having to go to the next whole pixel location. Uh, that's just the plot implementation. But anyway, you can see as these things go, the, uh, the edges are kind of graduated to make like um, kind of variable, well, variable intensity staircase steps, which when this becomes one to one, right now each pixel you're seeing is eight by eight pixels on the screen. So it's, it's big enough that we can see what's actually happening. Right, so when I, uh, let's see, let me get here. I'll change the uh, dot size to one, and then we can see what it looks like when you actually see it on the screen at, at scale. Let's see here. This is funny, Windows, every other time I do it, it Okay, now you can see those two lines there, right? The tiny ones. And I can get rid of, let me get rid of the, the time delay. Whoops. For those who haven't seen this tool, this is Chip's development tool called Peanut, which is available on our forums. And then the pieces of this feed into the prop tool for Windows, which Jeff will create. Yeah, so, so here you can you see these red and green lines spinning around, right? So this has the you know visual effect of looking like there's a lot more resolution than there actually is. That little display is 101 by 101 pixels, um, but with with that alpha with the um, you know alpha blending with the background for proportional pixels, everything winds up looking really nice. Yeah, so, good. And the, up, the upshot of this is, let's see, so this was just a little demo thing I made. Let me pull up something bigger. So you know that egg beater animation? It shows the, uh, you know, how the memory works on the P2. Let's see here. Yeah, now everything in the plot uh, display is anti-aliased now. The shapes are anti-aliased. The text already is because that's how Windows prints it. Um, but all the lines and shapes are now anti-aliased. And the, for the shapes, I also changed around the syntax for the plot so that uh, you have to set coordinates and then you can do any kind of shape, dot, or line. But I, I wanted to divorce the uh, coordinate spec from, from everything that might happen because there's a lot of times when you want to move to a certain location and do a series of things without having to reset the, the X, Y all the time, or the row theta if you're in, if you're in uh, polar mode. So let's see, line test to, ah, okay, close up. So here you can see, this is a shape, right? So it's anti-aliased 
Windows is anti-aliasing the text as it prints it, but the plot shape drawer is anti-aliasing the, uh, the, the, the the circle and the thin circle. So now we have, uh, we have, you can make boxes which don't need to be anti-aliased because they're integral pixels, but you can do boxes with rounded edges, uh, which would look like this. You can do circles and ovals. That's it, circles, ovals, rectangles, and, and boxes with rounded edges. So I call the, the rectangle just box. So box and O box for round box, oval and circle. Anyway, this makes things really pretty. So, you know, as we make GIFs and things for the documentation, it looks pretty decent when it goes into the final uh, Google Doc or something. You don't see any pixels. And at scale, if we look at this thing at one, if we change the dot size to one, Whoops, Windows every other time goes to my other screen. So you can see it looks pretty rounded. Now, this anti-alias line drawing is really nice for uh, instrumentation stuff like uh, the scope and the FFT. So here they are. I don't know if you'll be able to see from, you know, the, band, the, the connection we have is not that great, but all these lines that are being drawn for the FFT and the scope, they're all registered to 256 of a pixel for the endpoints, and they're anti-aliased, and uh, it works really nicely. For things like sine patterns, like if a sine wave gets pretty high frequency and the, the, the waveform becomes very compressed, if you don't have anti-aliasing, your brain starts to see more A patterns you know, the, from the cyclical, you know, where it's stepping X and Y, and it does not look like sine waves at all. But with anti-aliasing, it looks great. Like I could probably change this thing. I could make this a little bit higher. I think if I change this. Can you turn off the anti-aliasing just to show the difference? Yes, I can. Let me, let me, I'll have to, let me go into my, uh, back to my app here and go to the, let's see, we are looking at, okay, let me go to the line draw and I will put a little thing in here. So I'll say, okay, here we go. I'm gonna add a little line if, uh, let's see, if opacity is not full, um, then it equals full. Wait, I'll say if it's greater than zero, then it's FF. So it forces it to, to full opacity anytime it's greater than zero. Now, let's see, okay, that's compiling, running. Oh, I gotta kill another instance of this. Okay, now if I did this right, move this back into here. Uh, this one here. Now, try to run it. There we go. Can you see the difference? Yeah, the difference is huge. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So, you see, it looks like there's a lot of pixels there that are turned on, right? And there are. But when the aliasing, you're only partially turning on those edge pixels. So, you wind up with a very fine inner line that's well placed. So let me turn that back off. Let's see. I'll just comment out that line I just put in. Anyway, this thing was a total brain buster. It, it just about wore me out trying to get this thing working. I'm glad it's done for now. I, I could, oh, I'll show you the, uh, let's see, the line. I'll show you where the, the, the incompleteness is in this whole thing. All right, now let me slow this down. Okay, so you see that everything is nicely anti-aliased except the flat ends on these things. Now, but watch, when we get to, we want to cross the 45 degree threshold, the flat turns to the turns to the, the uh, perpendicular edge of the circle or edge of the endpoint. And so the reason this is 
the way it is is because it's drawing slices. Everything is sliced. So when it's when the line is more vertical than it is horizontal, it's drawing the slices horizontally. And when the line is more horizontal than vertical, it's drawing the slices vertically. And so that keeps the inner loop of the line draw really simple. Um, you can see there the green, the flat, the edge. Let's see, there's no anti-aliasing on the left and right edge. Watch, as it crosses 45 degrees, that flat has now turned to the top and bottom edge. So I'd have to do a little extra work, and I think I know what to do, and I'll probably get there eventually, but I'm not in a hurry because this looks pretty decent as it is. For, for the length of the line, and for the most part, it looks fine, but uh, if you see these unaliased, un, if you see the aliased endpoints, that are not smooth, then you can kind of notice that when you get to the 1x scale. But it's not much. I mean, for the most part, the line looks really good. Let me go back to the... Uh, I think it's a perfectly scene. worthy compromise. Yeah, I, I don't think it... Um, it's not bad. I mean, you don't really notice it. If you, if you move everything to 1x and you look at it, you can see a little bit of nubby action going on in the ends of the endpoints, but it's not that noticeable. Now, I'll eventually, I'm sure I'll probably get it cleaned up, but what I have right now is, is uh, algorithmically really simple. And it's, it's like 95%, you know, maybe 97%. So to get that last 3% would like probably triple the complexity. Although Roy might have, Roy's pretty good at all this kind of stuff. He might have some better ideas, but it just, this is like the hardest thing I've done for a while. And in the end, it's not much. The code's not very big, but arriving at the, con you know, getting the concept ironed out and arriving at the solution was just really taxing. I mean, I'd probably be dead in a year if I had to work on that kind of stuff all the time. I think that's all I've got for all this sort of anti-aliasing stuff. Oh, I was going to show, I was going to increase the, uh, Let's, let's make the sign really dense, right? So high frequency. So you can see as those things compress, it gets a little funny on the top and bottom because the samples are no longer at the extrema. They're, they're falling in places where they're not at the edge anymore. But your brain, because it's anti-aliased, your, your brain is not seeing more A patterns. You're actually seeing lots of, lots of sine waves or, or sine wave that's uh, not looking like it's something different. Anyway, I've got the, uh, I'm updating the documentation on the uh, Google thing and I, I need to push out a new version of this. I'll hopefully have that done by the end of tomorrow. I wanted to have it done today, but I just didn't have the time. Um, but I'll get this done soon. And then if anyone wants to play with all this graphical debug stuff, you can do so. And I'll put some new examples in there too. And then peanut can be found on propeller.parallax.com and on the forums, right? Right. I mean, right. I should know where it's been getting posted. I know you put a copy on the forums, but then I think Jeff also puts it on propeller.parallax.com. Right, right. And I know people ah. are interested too, Chip, um, in Jeff's integration of this in Propeller tool. That's your next step after peanuts proven to be working. Wait, say that again, Ken. Sorry. Uh, okay, so after you get this working in peanut, and it it is used for a while, then we integrate it in the prop tool. Right. Right. Yeah, I think the road to do that should be getting pretty well paved right now. So as I make new stuff, Jeff should be able to put it into that app without too much trouble. Yeah. Okay. We'll give Jeff half of an afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so someone, okay, as Jim Granville asked here, uh, can the anti-alias be user, uh, wait, something just scrolled. Can it, be, can it be a user choice? It could be, and I thought about that, but um, someone was saying, well, what if it's not letting me see the actual pixel? Because I'm someone who likes to see exact values too. But I think to achieve that, what we need to do is put like a, like a, a staircase step mode in the scope where you get the benefit of really, you know, sub pixel placement, but you'll just have a line for that sample rather without the vertical connect line, because the vertical connect line is going to obfuscate the nice little 
level that you had for that pixel. So I think the way around it is just to do stuff like that because it really is beneficial and your brain perceives placement that's you know way below a pixel in resolution. Um, we just need to not booger it up with like you know too much vertical mixed in with horizontal or vice versa depending on you know what it is you're doing. So I will I'll probably add that to the scope mode today. So I'll have a little thing that just for the for the period of the uh, sample it will just draw a flat line and the next flat line will be up here and that will give you what you're looking for. Well, while you were talking, we sold out mm -hmm. of uh, Johnny Max and most of the P2 Edge modules. Man, if we could just make them cheaply, we'd have a business. We would. Mm -hmm. I think Carol must have bought a dozen of them, though. Oh, mm -hmm. I wasn't greedy this time. I bought one of these. Hey, <laughs> uh, Ken, is there one for me anywhere? Yeah, we'll, we'll save one for you. You could have mine, worst case. Yeah, I'm really curious, Chip, um, your request to cut the traces. I'm, I'm interested in knowing if forum members are okay just plugging this in the right way because we gave our manual milling machine up. It's in, in your shop now. Right. Well, yeah, I know. But like someone said, you could take a Dremel tool with a little side cutter. And if you made a little jig that you could slide, hold the Dremel tool still, and then slide the board into a jig where it captures like the, the, the edge card end and then has a stop for the fingers. You could just go bzz, bzz, and e each time you run a board and it would cut those two traces and it would look like a machine did it. Okay, we could do that. Do people want them cut or do they have a preference? I would I'm take fine. one. I'm I'm fine either way. And so yep, I'm not gonna I'd do spe one. special order um, uh, sandwiches with that request, but just in general, I mean, Uncut or, or cut? Uncut is better because I prefer mine. I, okay, now I see one. Somebody they wants can. to cut. Yeah. Why don't we do a demonstration where you show the board working and then you plug it in backwards and then put it back the right way and it doesn't work anymore? Why would I want to do that? <laughs> That's breaking a perfectly good board. Yeah, you're four hours It'll away. Break from, it. It this will is break all we got. <laughs> hey, I need to give a tip to everybody if they want to uh, cut those traces themselves. Um, I just used an X-Acto knife when we were testing this. And um, I can say that if you press down a little too hard, you end up mashing um, those ground traces into the layer that's also ground right underneath. And so it's really not electrically disconnected. So, so what we did is we cut it just a little bit lower than the top of the pads. And then I took a, um, a, a meter to just ohm it out to check that, uh, that the connections down below cl closest to the edge were really not connected to what used to be also the same pad above it. Uh, and I had to redo it a couple of times because um, the first time I, I pressed pretty hard, that's really, really thin gold on those pads. So you really don't need to cut very hard. Oh. Ken's going to do some surgery uh -oh. right now. Hey, well, do we want to see this doc. since we're all together? Or do we want Stephen Morocco to share his LED stuff if he's up for it? Go for it. Yeah, if you can show us what Okay, to we'll do get this cool. done. Okay, so Jeff, I was picking out my X-Acto knife when you were talking, but were you saying cut these two traces here? Yeah, cut those two traces. And um, I, I don't know if there's any need to, I mean, it looks, I think you can cut it right there, but um, I did it really close to where the top where the yeah right there. Yep, I just sliced across, and again I didn't cut very hard, but right I cut a little too hard the first time, and then I had to take a meter on um, to check the bottom of what is now two traces or you know two pads against the top of what used to be connected, and then side to side too, uh, because you could end up uh, getting some gold pad mashed between the two of them side to side. Okay. You know, that's a six layer board, right? And it's uh, Michael von Sarvash, we were going over that. And you know that, that it's made up of a set of sandwiches, right? There's like, uh, there are, I believe, three two layer boards in that with two insulators in between. 
And these boards are like, like from the top metal to the second layer metal, that substrate is like two mils thick. So right beneath the surface of the top metal is the bottom metal. There's a very like two mil insulator between them. But when you cut into that, uh, Michael said it's, it's just ground under all that area. So you're not gonna, it doesn't matter if you smush it, as long as you've cut that top pad, it's gonna be okay. Think I've done it? Yeah, yeah, it looks like you've done it. Okay, and you guys know I'm a total hack. So this is like, if I could do this, yeah. I'm sure it's anyone- It's me. <laughs> well, I'm only doing if it to point you, out, you guys could if, definitely do it. Okay, if you don't use those pins, is it st do you still have to cut it or is it a matter of something's going to happen measure, bad? Right? It's just a safety measure that if you reverse the card, you're, you're not going to blow the chip. Okay, so if I know not to use those pins, it doesn't make any difference, right? Or well, if you don't reverse Those the pins chip. are ground pins. Yeah. It's just, yeah. But just what, thinking. what this does is protect you if you do plug it in backwards, which maybe Ken can show the right and wrong way once again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, I, I would I say, gotcha. yeah, in your case, Carol, don't cut anything and just plug it in the right way. Hey, one thing Carol asked, so, you know, aren't those ground pins and aren't they needed? Well, we did put a set of ground pins on either end of that, either end of the board, uh, because it's good to have, you know, ground all around. But what we did is we had, we, we have to have the five volt pins mirrored by nothing on the top side. That That's, that's. A necessity. So we, we can't have anything on those pins. However, the, the, the other side of the board looks like this, pin wise, five volts, five volts, ground, ground. And then there was a, a no connect pin, which is now a, another ground. So there's two five volt pins in a row and then, or two five volt fingers in a row and then three ground fingers in a row. And once those signals get onto the edge module, there are huge, there's lots of vias that bring them in to, from those three uh, pads or fingers. And then there's lots and lots of ground planes with on those inner layers with lots and lots of vias. So it is, a, I think, quite a sufficient ground for the whole board um, because the board impedance is pretty low. Okay. So, so it wasn't like we really that? needed two extra ground pins on the other side, but it just seemed like good practice to put them and we had the pins to spare. So the process now, Chip, you just want me to hot swap, turn it around or turn power off no. and then? Yeah, let's see if it really did it. Okay. No, let's don't turn the power it. off. Well, Boom. you saw it checked with the ohm meter, right? You checked with the mm -hmm. meter, it should be good. Yeah, yeah just make a mistake. Keep, keep point it at the breadboard and you're gonna be fine. Yes. Just the <laughs> right. yes. In real life, don't plug it in this way that he has it okay. now. Don't ever do that. Yeah, yeah so right. it's a bad idea. Now we'll turn around the right way and see if my trace cuts were effective. Oh, boy. Yeah. Making us nervous, man. That's all right. There you have it. See? Yep. Well, it was well, perfectly fine. Surgery was successful. Hey. Oh, oh, yeah. It's running the program. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. And he didn't cut his fingers either. <laughs> so it did look like he damaged one finger there earlier. Uh, well, if you guys want to see the chainsaw toe, just ask. Yeah. So by the way, if you don't do this, what did you do? like you what we did, toe? almost lost it. <laughs> if you don't do that cut um, that we just showed and then plug it in backwards by accident, You'll, your power supply will uh, have like, a, I don't know, upwards of a half an amp to an amp pulled out of it. Uh, not a good. Not a crowbar, a small power supply. So uh, Chip, you still want us to cut all these for everybody? I think you should, yeah, and test them just to make sure you did it right. Okay, well, we'll try to come up with a better idea than what I just did. Well, but, um, get a Dremel tool with a yeah, side cutter, like a little I wheel. I gotcha. Of, and then just make a little jig, and you just stick the board okay. in there. It'll do it, every one the same weight, and it'll look perfect. It, it will not look like an accident happened. All right. You just got to make sure attendees really don't want them cut. 
Well, <laughs> yeah, okay, I don't know. What I'm struggling with. I think since we showed it um, and people know how to plug it in, they'd pref probably mostly prefer it uncut. Okay. Yeah, don't well, cut can... mine. Now I'm taking custom orders. I'm you seeing more don't them out, cuts. But I think you know, I'd rather do chip. To cut them. I'd rather uncut them, and then if they blow them up, just replace them. Do a parallax style warranty <laughs> for them. Okay, so nobody blow them up, please. Yeah, it'll delay shipping. You're right, Greg. You'll be waiting another day. <laughs> uh, okay, so maybe don't. Pe pe seems like people don't want them cut. Yeah. Yeah. Don't cut. Okay. There, there's a few people that wanted them cut, but uh, I think it's worth it to just do what Ken said and just if they happen to blow theirs up, replace them. Yeah, and if you're really concerned about this, um, just send me an email. Okay, I just put my email address there. I'll personally <laughs> see that yours is cut, okay? <laughs> there, early adopter process. So um, we can go on to questions, discussion, or Stephen, do you want to give us an update on your cool project? I can, uh, sure, I can just show you a couple pictures real quick. Uh, the board's set up in my other room, and I don't really want to unwire it. <laughs> yeah, don't. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, share screen. Pick something to share that looks reasonable. Yeah, uh, that, was, that was a bunch of uh, logic analyzer stuff on there. Yeah, exactly. So here's my setup originally. And you can see that I uh, did a, a breadboard for <laughs> routing the cables and logic analyzer. And I'm doing fly, flying wires with 3.3 uh, to 5 volt level shifters hanging down in the middle down there. So basically, I created this, and I still left the uh, logic analyzers pins there. I also had uh, 14 and 15 of the 16 pins unused. So I exposed a header for 3.3 and a header for 5 volt um, on those, which then I tend to use as uh, signaling marks. So my logic analyzer can pick up timings and journeys. So when put in place then, that's what the board looks like. They just came back from JL PCB, JLC PCB. Thank you, uh, John McPhalin for recommending them. Quick turnaround, but uh, we had a little bit of snow and DHL was gonna delay it in extra day. I called them and they brought it in for me so I could show you in time today. Uh, the board, um, I soldered the parts myself and uh, the thing works beautifully, it turned on, everything checked out. Of course, um, in true, I'm constantly a learning spirit, I moved them to another connector set from uh, 48 to 32. And of course, that forced me to remember to move all my stuff in my driver for pins. And so uh, now in PASM and in SPIN, I've got the uh, selection set so I can move pretty rapidly between the four connector sets. Um, you can see it here with logic analyzer connected up. I kept the old setup so I can actually run two different boards and look at results in the two. I uh, picked up what five boards in the initial set and there you see it worked there as well. Um, did a little bit of work with uh, the gamma correction and the uh, Pulse with mod modulation, so the colors are looking pretty good now. And so you can see there it's reasonably good. It's not at all as high a resolution as I'd like, um, only because right now I'm doing uh, eight adjustments to phase on PWM, and I'm going to have to figure out how to do many more adjustments if I want to have a richer color set. But that's a pretty reasonable color set for now. Um, here I'm doing the 11 by 11 grids where it's uh, blue green with yellow uh, for 11 panels. And so you get, sorry about the exposure there, it looks really terrible. And then there's a black and white on the bottom right hand corner. I need a much better picture of that. Stephen? Yes. On your dot matrix thing here, do you have to um, program a whole line, line by line, or can you address the pixels individually? I am, I have set up the driver so that you color it pixel by pixel with row column information, and you have line drawing, and you have text placement, and you have object drawing, um, and it puts it on the screen, uh, real estate, in 24 mm -hmm. color, and then my driver behind the scenes 
you say I'm done composing the screen, just flush it out to the system to be displayed. And it does all the remapping and PWM and everything else for you. So if from a logical standpoint, you just draw into a screen space and the screen space is going to be configurable based on the number of panels you have horizontally and vertically and the cable arrangement. And so I have a single spin file, which is nothing but constants that you modify as the person that's setting up this driver to how many panels you have, what are the geometry of the panels and what chipset are you using? And the code then does the adaptation when it first loads. Okay, it's a lot easier than the dot matrices I have been making. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to make this pretty easy for everybody. Um, I'm going to be going through a code review with uh, John here, if he's willing, uh, to take a look at it. And uh, then I'll be posting it at the site. Uh, and ultimately, we'll have this up in the object exchange. But uh, so that's what I have for now. Hey, Stephen. <coughs> yes. You can take those things off of your board. There are those little parts that were just for the pick and place machine to, to move to uh, place the uh, header receptacles. Yeah. I Those found out they're really good for, um, there was a really wonderful thing that happened to me and I appreciate what you're saying because I've always wondered what they are for, but I found a use for them. When I first put this thing on, my signals were all looking very erratic. It turned out I hadn't pressed the connectors in far enough. And well, you, you, hadn't, you hadn't done what? Brushed? I hadn't placed the board down far enough onto the connectors. Oh. And so I was getting amazing timings. My logic analyzer was just going crazy. And so what I found out was they actually serve to be great press points to, to tell me that I've got it down far enough without poking pins through my fingers. So I'm oh. kind of liking them. <laughs> I gotcha. So I found a purpose for them. <laughs> I see. Quite accidentally. Carol, I have, I, as I, Indicator. I have one of these panels too that I ripped out of a plastic pink purse and thanks to some information I got from Steven and you know sludging around the internet a little bit I was able to write a driver for this now since Steven has done such an amazing job on his driver I'm keeping mine deliberately very simple it's just for one 16 by 32 panel and it's a hundred percent spin uh, so the idea is for new people to be able to learn and then as they transition to Steven's driver, you know, it, it'll help them understand. Um, and then I have, you know, a project to do with this as well. But these are really simple and just like with Steven's, it just, I, I have a 512 byte array and I can put a color into a pixel. He's doing 24 bit color, I'm doing 3 bit color. Um, and, but it's still, it works really nicely. We've both got scrolling text and lines and circles and all that jazz. It's really fun. Well, see what I'm trying to do is make a flexible one that I can put like on the bottom of the elevate and make an advertising scroll. And I've been doing it by, uh, I think I got one here. Hidden. Oh, I don't know where it is. No, it's on my YouTube channel, pictures of them. What I took was the, the long strip you get of uh, RGB LEDs, the WS2812, I think it is. Right. right. And put them on, lined them up very carefully on rolls of duct tape. Yes. And it came out pretty good, except I have to do a lot of wiring at the end, each end of it to get that part right. But I've got one that works perfectly. That's maybe 158 LEDs long mm -hmm. and six deep. So I've so got this is that. Where Steven's driver might help you because these panels right. which are inexpensive and you can link them together and his, his driver allows you to configure them that way. So you could have a 16 tall panel. This that's what this one I have is 16 by 32. I think there's also 32 by 32 panels that are available. But they, anyway, they, okay. they act like shift registers, so they're pretty easy to link together. And Steven's driver covers that configuration. So you know you might consider just getting a few of these panels and, and linking them together. And now you have a fully bitmap display with text and graphics. 
Well, it'd be kind of square looking though. Why I'm doing it this way is to make it flexible. Oh, okay, got it. I didn't understand make that. Make a nice round. I see, okay. Carol, how yes. flexible do you need? Because they do make a, um, a flex version of these panels, as long as you're not doing really sharp corners. No, I don't. It's just to fit around the bottom of an elevate. It's going to hang from it on the bottom of an elevate to oh. use as an outdoor. Like a skirt display. around the bottom? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Take, a, <laughs> take a look at Amazon and look at the uh, these uh, panels, and they have flexible versions there, you can see. Yeah, exactly. I have. Okay, a, I'll I, do that. I'll look at it. Uh, I, have, I have a couple of the flexible panels from right. Amazon. You can. You could bend them around in a circle as long as you don't do sharp corners they're fine like yeah. i've i wrapped one around a, a parallaxy bot and it was fine so very feasible i also have done a lot of work with the same pixel strips that you're talking about uh-huh and so it wouldn't be hard for me to uh, create an alternate form of the driver that does the same thing for those as well they're addressed very differently but <laughs> The one work. I have now, I've programmed a few things on it, and uh, the hard thing with making a moving picture, like have your words go around it, it's like doing a flip page. Yes. You know, I have to do every single page separately yes. to address everything and then let it run. That's one of the and, things I was actually going to experiment with on this driver, is being able to draw in the layers. And so you can have uh, have the layers just superimpose over each other with the topmost winning. And so you can get away with some some really interesting effects in that regard. How does the voltage work though? Um, the WS2812s, if the number's right that I'm saying, uh, are very high voltage. And oh yes. Uh, these panels, if you're not doing PWM, can consume four amps apiece on the 64 by 32s. Um, when I'm running uh, full color screens, though, I'm sitting under an amp generally with a PWM. And yeah. if I spread that PWM out even further to go a uh, higher definition color, um, it'll still stay low like that. Okay. Fortunately, the Elevate can lift five pounds. So you can put a yeah, lot of battery an, there if you have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, one of the things I found interesting for me to get uh, good animation rates is I had to move the splitting out of the uh, screen into the PWM buffers. I had to move that into spin into the PASM to uh, get the to get the conversion rates fast enough. But it was wonderfully amazing once I did. I'm getting right now. I had to. My initial numbers were way off. Um, I'm painting this thing at eight kilohertz frame rate right now. Uh, for single three-bit color. And so with the eight-bit PWM, um, I'm dropped down to, that's a kilohertz frame rate. So I can get pretty crazy. That that puts me up to 250, 256 frames per second on a quad panel board, which could be quite fun. Only your cat will know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm enjoying the experiment. It's fun. That's what it's about. Just developing something like that is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I'm always Agreed. happy when I get it right. <laughs> I know. So yeah, as soon as I put my driver out there, um, Carol, you'll be able to, um, hopefully it'll give you some ideas if you aren't already for how to do it. Okay, thanks, I'll do that. Stephen, can you share the uh, description for someone linking it up on Amazon again? Oh yeah, uh, for the panels? Yeah. Sure. I can do a quick look up and I'll just throw a link in the chat. Oh, I can do a look up too. I'm a, I've been living off of Amazon for the last six months. Yeah, I hear you. So even we'll my food. <laughs> your your board also um, at some point to the masses. Yes. So others can play along. Yeah, I'm not sure how to do that. I haven't. I don't do a whole lot of selling of boards, and so um, we'll find somebody who writes to, writes in magazines and have them do an article for you. Okay, that's your job. So maybe what we could do is, <laughs> thanks, Carol. Maybe we can get these made um, at Parallax uh, when Stephen's ready. 
and then have them available for people because this, this will become a popular application. Yes. I think Johnny Mac is working with it already. Yeah. You're on mute, so. Yeah, these are the same. Yeah, that's a yeah I was just saying, you, you know, for short connections, you can connect direct. This is, you know, Stephen has a much nicer solution, but as I've been experimenting, see, I have my eval board and my, my display connected directly. And, yeah. and as Stephen was suggesting, even though I'm using three bit color, I, I also have a, a, a overall brightness control um, yeah. so that, that, that I can pull, yeah. the, pull it down um, so that I'm not, especially since I'm pulling five volts out of my, my eval board right now. So I'm, I'm keeping the brightness way down um, as I'm experimenting. I'm trying to see if I can find any good pen resolutions like this. Yeah, I'm, I have a. Yeah. Where are they? So, does the P2 bring a specific benefit to driving these? Um, what you'll find is that most people driving these panels, um, the majority of projects are doing two things. Uh, they have custom hardware as a pie hat uh, with special chips, chips doing the buffering. Uh, the other one I particularly liked is uh, they took FPGAs and generate the circuitry and start generating, start driving them that way. And so, yes, there. Um, if we go to high PWM rates, if I really want to do full 24-bit color, um, we're going to be using quite a bit of memory to, uh, to generate the strength of information that we need to put out. Um, right now, um, Oh, I don't even remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I'm not using very much because I'm only doing effectively um, eight PWM phases. And I need to get that much higher if I really want to go uh, much higher resolution color. One, so one a lot of memory. Uh, I, I'm also, I'm only driving this at 10 megahertz bit rate right now. I'd love to be able to get it up to 30. Um, but it's getting pretty hard, even in thousand, to get above where I am, given the amount of work I have to do. And so there's quite a bit of studying there. I'm sure we'll be able to find a couple of optimizations still. So I'm driving all six color bits simultaneously. So I am literally driving um, red, green, and blue for two halves of the panel simultaneously. So six bits shifted out simultaneously at 10 megahertz. So is there a relationship between more panels and the resolution speed? Um, only in that it, um, visibly, no. In terms of the amount of data you're sending, yes. Four panels is four times the amount of data. So memory shortage comes faster. Correct. And so- And, the, and you do eventually get enough panels that your frame rate has to go down. Like your correct. PWM rates have to go down. Correct. But the P2 can go fast enough, much faster than most of the other processors. And yeah, what frequency are you running it at, Stephen? Um, I'm writing it, um, I like to run high <laughs> while I'm experimenting <laughs> because I don't want, know what I need. So I tend to run uh, 340, 335, somewhere around there. Uh, I see. That's a Colorado That's answer. High. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're high altitude out here. Even on my little tiny spin driver, and I, I st have standardized on 200 megahertz for all of my code, and I'm running a pure spin driver. So I'm running a spin cog that is doing the driver, and I was able to get, I, I didn't go past it, but I was able to get one kilohertz without any problems at all. Right. Yeah. And so so the, the advantage, Ken, you, you know, with, with the P2 is, of course, then the driver lands in his own cog, and so your foreground isn't you're not taking any cycles away from your foreground to create the screen, or what am I trying to refresh the screen? To refresh it, correct. Just, just to do the creation, whereas another processor, you have to do the creation and the interrupt or something else is taking care of the screen refresh. So this is, you know, this is a generic benefit of the propeller anyway. Right, and so I'm finding it, a, the whole experiment was to find out how good it is at driving it. And so in answering your question, Ken, most, it kind of, we kind of topped out on the P1s mm -hmm. because of memory increase. We're not topping out on the P2. And so we're, we're uh, 
it, I'm finding it a lot of fun to work with. It's interesting. It looks like a lot of the pictures are, are using very low display capability, like letters and scrolling text. And here you're driving the whole thing with rain rainbows. Correct. And that's because they're using um, Arduinos. Yeah. On, like, all of the pictures. Wow. So with the library, they can't do the kinds of things that we can do with YouTube. And so they have very carefully crafted libraries and very slow display rates. Mm -hmm. Well, I just ordered one. This is so much fun. <laughs> well, what I'd like to do is use Chip's FFT for clarinet tone detection to drive one of these. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, FFT is not not the approach. It's too it's too imprecise. We need. I need to read up on some stuff that. Um, well, what is his name? I don't see him here today, but he gave me all these links to some books on music and math. I think we've got colored equalizers in our future. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but the FFTs it's it's not the right approach for such precision. I don't know what we need, but we need something different. Okay. <laughs> well, the music's in math, it's either Nikos or Wit. So, so I guess you could go to music for Ken, from Ken. <laughs> well, usually the process with my projects and Chip is a lot of begging until he gives in. You can't bribe him? No, he doesn't list. He's not accountable. Mm. Yeah. I got fired from every job before Parallax. <laughs> you made your own job. <laughs> well, yesterday I, I spent a couple hours on Hangouts with him, yelling at him in German to produce the data sheet. <laughs> it was not effective. Wo ist mein Datenblatter? Does he understand German? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Hello. Here. Uh, so, here. while you guys chat, just give you a sales update. Um, if anyone's still watching, for those who've tried to order the Johnny Max or the P2 Edge, we are sold out, and the back order was equivalent to 50 of the Johnny Max, so we have terminated the special offer. Whoa. And we will use this as a gimmick to draw more people in the future to the P2 Live Forum. <laughs> it worked well. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get on QVC? We, we hit like 90 people. Yes. Yeah. Well, now we need Johnny Mac's little brother and the Roy Eltham wicked twin or something. <laughs> What's the subject of the next thing so I can study up for it a little and play with my P2? So it's um, Flex Basic if, if you want to get okay. into that. And um, it's Eric Smith and he's going to show us how to use it and how to call spin objects from basic and talk about what it can do. And okay. I can share it to you right now. The, the download is flex prop. Flex There's, prop. Uh, messages oh, flex on the, prop. On yeah, the forum. Okay. He's renamed it. It was called flex GUI. Now it's called flex prop. Oh, that's okay. good. And I have just shared to you, Carol, the instructions for setting it up. Okay. Via Google. And and I just submitted a pull request to him that he accepted, but I don't think he's published yet with a, a bunch more uh, simple tools stuff working. So there's a simple tools dot H include that you can include in in flex C and you'll get all the same functionality as if you were using simple IDE from C for simple. What's tools. the difference between flex prop and flex C? FlexProp does basic C, spin, and spin2. It does all four languages all in one. Oh, OK. Um, and they can interoperate. So you can like write C code and call spin code and vice versa. OK. Um, and FlexProp it's a simple, is the tool. Yeah, FlexProp is like the name of the little IDE tool that he made that lets you edit the source code. And it does all the compiling and downloading to the propeller two for you. Like it has buttons to do all that for you. Um, okay. It also will target the P1 so you can write the same thing and compile for both. Processes. And there is one gotcha I experienced, Roy, maybe you can confirm this. When you save your source code, you have to give it the right extension. 
for otherwise spin, it won't yes. know what it's looking at. Yeah, yeah. You need to save it as spin or spin two for the spin or spin two syntax differences. Um, obviously, for C and basic, you save them with the appropriate extension. Kind of off topic, but uh, John, Johnny Mac, uh, you got you got do something about your uh, background and your green hair would be good for St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I, I, as I was saying, Jim, I actually had to do an audition yesterday. So I set up another light in my office. I turned it on today and, and the green screen is physically right behind me, which is anybody who knows filmmaking knows that's a bad idea. It should be way yep. back, uh, but it's not, it's right behind me. So sorry. I, you know, I, I, I didn't use this background with my audition. I just, uh, just chroma keyed everything out. But yeah, you see that, that in the, the, uh, the, the green fringe and halo, that's not so good. It looks like a, a cheap movie. I use software too for my, my, my audition. So there was no green fringe. Yeah. It, really really the looks, it, it looks like green day. <laughs> Yeah, the, the the main reason you want the distance is because the light reflecting off the yeah. green is yeah. bouncing off your back yeah. and your hair. That's why exactly we see it. it's called spill. Yeah. Next time wear a green t-shirt, and that'd be great for Halloween. That'd be a floating head. head yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do that, Carol. I'm gonna do that next week. <laughs> That's great fun. So we have others around here that are kind of quiet, might have some questions. I wonder if anybody wants to ask questions of anybody else. I'm, I'm going to ask my friend Josh Wims to chime in when he gets a chance. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted somebody else, but my friend Josh uses the, the P2, or the P1 rather, in laser tag. So I'll bet you he has some good questions. Right, Josh? Maybe not. I've got a couple of questions. I have a question for everyone. We'll do Greg first. Yeah. Um, I use a Mac, unfortunately, I guess. <laughs> so you kind of probably got to guess what's coming. <laughs> um, first off, is the Propeller IDE tool going to get updated for the Prop 2? I don't see that happening, unfortunately. Okay. The developers moved on other things. Okay. And then, and then um, I did hear, I think one of Johnny's things he did a while back said that the, the prop tool was too proprietary to get it ported over to the Mac. Yeah, yeah. the short of it is that it has some um, license stuff in it relating okay. to displays or, or text editor that we can't seem to cross compile on other platforms. But I think there are other issues deeper than that. Um, in regards to the the compiler, right, Chip? Yeah. Well, most of the yeah. compiler, the, the, all the right. compiler guts are written in eighty three eighty six. So uh, FlexProp runs on the Mac. He provides a Mac build of FlexProp. All right. Um, okay. Nice. You can also uh, people have had success running Prop Tool under. Uh, Wine. I think there's a Mac version of Wine that they can run it okay. through. Well, you just made a major statement, Roy. I was totally unaware that FlexProp runs on a Mac. So all the spin code we have then could be run via Mac. Yes. If FlexProp runs on Mac, Linux, and Windows, and probably even Raspberry Pi. Well, how is it able to do this without our compiler being written in C? Cause, because, uh, uh, Eric wrote a compiler from scratch that produces PASM. Ah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Fastbin. Eric Austin? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Eric, Eric Smith. Smith. Um, oh, okay. One key thing to know is uh, FlexProp, tar it, it writes PASM output and you run in hub exec mode. Um, it has some directives so you can put functions in other cogs, but no. you're running in hub exec. You're not running, you know, native on the cog most of the time, but it's I, pretty much I can, full speed. I'm running it native on a cog. You 
can you can you can use some tags to get functions to go right into a cog and stuff like that but the the code is PASM. it's not like uh chips bin code where it creates a byte code and then runs an interpreter for the byte code right. it's right. directly compiling to PASM. so the programs PASM. tend to be a little bit bigger but Roy, so if, if you have an object that has cog new in it, it will put that code into a cog, right? Um, well, it will start another cog and run the code in okay. HubExec by default, unless you oh, okay. you I can decorate it. you can decorate functions to be in cog memory or loot memory. Uh -huh. But aside from that, the, it's HubExec. Okay. Nice. And and <laughs> when you when you include a spin object and run it, it will put its stuff in a separate cog, right? Like, so the, um, like the dat section that has PASM in it will end up running in a cog, but the spin part of it will be compiled to have exact PASM that runs on a different cog. If anybody else out there is allergic to IDEs like I am, I run it on Vim with, and just use a script to do, to fast spin compile. Yeah, yeah. His he's uh, he just added uh, flexcc.exe, which is oh, cool. almost the same as Fastbin, but it has different error reporting output, so it's more compatible with standard. That's cool. Editors yeah. and compilers. It's really nice. Really helpful. Yeah. Um, one of the things I was researching is um, I uh, we saw the VS Code from Cluso on the VS Code extensions. And I've been looking into expanding that uh, with his help or you know, with, you know, while he's doing his board and things like this. And one of the things I was sad about is I can't find a way to color the background of the VS Code space. Otherwise I could make the whole thing look very much like our prop tool. So I am yeah. expanding the language syntax and I am uh, uh, making it rich for uh, P2 and I am putting the, uh, you know, the build actions and things like this in. So I'm yeah. hoping to get, I'm hoping to get a next draft of that out for us uh, late this week, early next week. Yeah, the colored background thing is really unique to prop tool. Like no other editors have that or support it. It's never, yeah, it's I mean, usually it's, you can control the entire background, but not sections of it like prop tool does. Right. And, and that's the, one of the external library pieces that they can't, Port to other platforms, which is why we don't have prop tool on other platforms. VS Code is a extensive is a uh, is a community grown yeah. thing. I wonder if we can ask to give us background control. Well, it's open source too, so you might be able to just go do it. <laughs> right, and then contribute it. Jeez, could get away with it though. I personally prefer not to have the colored background myself. I like colored syntax highlighting. Oh, we'll have not, that. Right. I much prefer dark backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so prop tool is super bright and blinding most of the time. But prop tool with dark mode, VS code. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. We should probably have some different color schemes. Uh, yeah. Is anybody interested in an update on uh, porting chips debugging tools to C so that it'll work for a lot more people? So. Your your mic is super muffled and distorted, um, Gerald. Can, can you hear me now? Is it too loud or what? We can hear you, but it's like you're on the other side of a wall or something. Hmm. Talking underwater. Does that change it? Hello? Is that any better? No. No. Can't get me at all by that. Gerald, I think, did we, we had this last time in, or oh, some time ago, but you had to turn down your gain. We were trying to turn it up and it seemed to be okay. the wrong way. So I think we actually had to counterintuitively um, yeah, turn down that. your gain on the audio mixer thing you had. Yeah. Is that better? It's still muffled. Yeah. I need to get an equalizer. I'm using a I wonder if it's picking up a different mic than yeah, you yeah, think yeah. It there's only there's only one microphone going through a uh, well, what going if you put your put your mouse next to it? Is it a laptop you can move around? No, no, this is a 
Intel 38 uh, micro, or a karaoke set or something, or a DJ set. It's just that this, uh, for some reason, Zoom does not like it. Let me see if I can get a setting. Telephone. Just briefly, while Can Gerald we... sorts out his audio, Chip, I've passed you host control. I have to go Got to it. family obligations, so you're on. If anybody has trouble with orders or getting parts, please let me know. I'll take care of you right away. Thank you. How's your mom? See you later, kids. <laughs> My mom, she's doing great. Thanks for asking. That's good. <laughs> I'll tell you, you said hi. recording, Ken, or you want to keep going? Or... Yeah, I'll stop recording as well. That happens when I check out. Thanks, Lachlan.